Continuing on with the activity of electrolytes, we're going to discuss the Debye-Huckel limiting law for the activity of electrolytes at very low concentration. So we have our set of ions here, which are going to be in the solution. Usually that's just a cation and an anion for a single electrolyte. So when I have the index I in the following equation, that's just going to indicate whatever ions are present. So in terms of the activity coefficient of the individual ions in solution, we're going to have that the natural log of the activity coefficient of a given ion, according to Debye-Huckel theory, is going to equal, it's going to be a constant called kappa times the charge of the ion. So that would be an inte some integer times the charge of the electron, divided by 8 pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times epsilon r, the dielectric constant of the solvent, times the Boltzmann constant, times temperature. And we're going to discuss in more detail what uh, a few of these things mean in a second, but I want to continue on with the next I want to continue on with the next equation as well, and that's the natural log of the mean ionic activity coefficient that we discussed in the previous video, according to Debye-Huckel theory, is going to be minus absolute value charge of the cation times charge of the anion times this value kappa divided by, and then again, 8 pi epsilon naught permittivity of free space, epsilon r, the dielectric constant of the solvent, times Boltzmann constant, times temperature. Okay, so first of all, we have this factor kappa, and what is that? So kappa, if you look at the value of 1 over kappa, that actually has a unit of distance, so this is called the Debye screening length, or screening distance. I'll call it length. And that's a value that depends on the given solvent, given ions. And th what this really indicates is this Debye screening length tells you something about how far it is to the next ion in solution. Kind of tells you about something called the ionosphere of a given ion in a given solvent. So this is a value which would be uh, tabulated uh, with respect to whatever situation you have, which electrolyte and, and solvent. And I'm going to define another quantity called the ionic strength. And that's going to be defined as ionic strength is going to be one half times the sum over all of the individual ions in solution of the square of the integer charge of all of those ions. So in, in units of the charge of the electron, what is the charge on the ion? So sodium is plus one, calcium plus two, uh, aluminum plus three, hydroxide minus one, uh, sulfate minus 2, etc., phosphate minus 3, and then times the concentration of that ion in its molarity. So this C is molarity that I'm indicating. So to recap the other constants that we've got going on here, Ci is the molarity of ion I. We have Zi is its integer charge. And then IC is called the ionic strength of the solution. And I, as I said, represents the cation and anion. OK, so now that we've defined this ionic strength, we can talk a little bit more about this value kappa. So kappa.
is going to be defined. It's usually defined in terms of kappa squared, but I'm just going to put a square root on this side and then go from there. So kappa would be 2 times the charge of the electron squared, which is something like 1.8 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, times Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and then times 1,000, which is a unit conversion, times the ionic strength, which is assumed to be in moles per liter. So molar or moles per liter. And then this divided by epsilon naught permittivity of free space. times dielectric constant of the solvent divided by Boltzmann constant times temperature. So as I see here, kappa, as I said, it's going to depend on the ions because it depends on what the ionic strength of the ions are, what their concentration is, and what their charges are. It depends on the solvent because it depends on the dielectric constant of the solvent. So epsilon r is the dielectric constant <coughs> of the solvent and that's usually a number it is always greater than or equal to one and it is usually less than about a hundred or so so I could say here that one is less than or equal to epsilon r which is approximately less than say about a hundred for water it's very high it's in the 80s for something very nonpolar like hexane, it'd be about four. Okay, so we talked about that. So as we can see here, uh, kappa and thus the log of our activity coefficient, that's going to depend on the square root of the ionic strength. So kappa, which appears in our equ equation for our activity coefficients, kappa is proportional to the square root of the ionic strength. And the ionic strength we see is proportional to, well, approximately proportional to the concentration or the molarity of our ions. So that's proportional to molarity. So the this value kappa is, is proportional to the square root of our concentration. So when we find our osmotic coefficient, to calculate these activity coefficients here at various molalities, that is usually expanded as a Taylor series in terms of polynomials of cons of molarity to the one half. So it's expanded in terms of, in terms of half powers of molarity. So if we took a Taylor series, that'd be a times c to the one half plus b times c to the one plus uh, we'll skip C and go to D, plus D times C to the 3 halves, plus E times C squared, etc., etc. So this whole thing here is the debye huckel limiting law. And the important thing to note here is that this is exact at very low concentrations for all ions. The higher the ionic strength, the faster it will deviate. So things with larger charges will deviate from the debye huckel law much faster. So something like calcium chloride which or calcium phosphate, things that have larger charges for their ions, are going to deviate from the debye huckel law much faster than something like sodium chloride, where everything is just a plus one and minus one charge. So this gives us a nice limit for very low concentrations and how we can think about the activity coefficients and the activities of ions, but we're going to have to use something different whenever you're going to larger and larger concentrations that are beyond, say, a, more than a couple hundredths or a tenth or two of moles per liter.